Hey everybody, welcome back. So I wanted to come on tonight and and actually uh, share a little bit about uh, kind of a little jaunt down memory lane that I went um, on this 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 evening. Um, Drew Lynn Salata, uh, who you guys might hopefully have heard of. He has a wonderful podcast called The Anxious Truth. He's written several great books about anxiety. There's a lot of great content on Instagram and TikTok. Um, he has a new podcast that he's doing with Josh Fletcher out of the UK called Disordered. And back in September, I had the uh, wonderful opportunity. He asked me to come on and, and be a, a guest on his podcast, The Anxious Truth. And I'll, I'll include some links to him as well as to this particular podcast down below if you haven't heard it. But I listened to it again tonight, and, I, and I'll tell you why I did that. Um, you know, sometimes we can be <laughs> our own best guides in this. And, you know, part of why I wrote The Waiting Room to begin with um, was to, was, was in trying to stay sane while I was going through this process, but also, you know, really trying to figure out in real time and share with people in real time, like what constructs, philosophies, ideas, am I finding useful and what am I not finding useful? And let me share this as I go along. And that's also the purpose of my having this YouTube channel. But, you know, today in the last couple of days, um, I've had a dip in my overall experience of, of how I've been feeling. And, you know, as we do in this, we have better times and we have times where we're getting kind of pummeled and I was getting kind of pummeled and I was starting to retreat um, back much further into myself and into that original place that I found myself years ago where I felt really um, like my confidence was stripped, um, very fear-based, you know, um, wanting to kind of go online and peruse the forums and I don't know, find myself just down rabbit holes, right? Which is what we do when we are in waves or when we're, you know, as I was for a long time in a constant state of, I wouldn't have called it a wave, it was a constant state of well, pure hell, but, um, but I've been, you know, blessed enough over the last year and a half or so to really be in the throes of windows and waves as I continue my Xanax taper. But anyway, um, if you're listening to this um, tonight, uh, two things I want to say. Number one is if you haven't subscribed, please do. Um, and um, basically any new content you'll be notified about. Uh, there should be a little tiny box, but it's the coloring is weird. And so I don't even know that you'll see it, but I think there's a way that you can just hit subscribe. And again, it will just allow for the content to pop up a little bit um, more quickly for people looking for content regarding benzodiazepine or medication discontinuation. Um, but I went back through and I, and I listened to myself. And it's funny because I, I think many of us feel the same way. Like when I hear my own voice, I'm like, eh, you know, like, oh gosh. Um, and in my talk with Drew, there was a lot of ums and a lot of this or whatever, but I, but it was, it was an interview I did. So what would it be now? Like nine months ago, it was back in September. And being the fact, being the fact that tonight I'm in kind of a not so great place when I listened to it, I was like, wow, I sounded so strong back then. How did I, you know, how, how did I, how did I sound so strong back in September? And now I'm back in this place that, that feels kind of you know, hard and scary and, and whatnot. And of course, then I've been reminded by my friend Dan just how far I've come and different people in my life do hold up that mirror for me when I cannot see it myself. But there were a couple of things that I spoke about in the podcast that if you haven't listened to it, I really want you to listen to it because he was interviewing me about the waiting room. But the reality is we weren't talking so much about the waiting room. We were talking about the process of benzodiazepine withdrawal. And Drew himself had gone through a pretty significant and severe protracted uh, withdrawal from an SSRI. And so could understand kind of the, the place that I was coming from. But there were just a couple things that I was saying that hit me tonight that I needed to hear for myself. The one of them being that this is a process, right? That, that, that yes, the ultimate desires that we're no longer, no longer going to have symptoms at some point, good desire to have. I believe we heal. Does that mean that I believe we have no anxious symptoms on the other side of this? I do not believe that unless we are also simultaneously working on a mindset 
that people that are not benzo or med injured also have to employ to be able to navigate through um, their their anxious and dark night of the soul. So there's a quote that I said in the in the interview, and it was that it's not when you it is not when you no longer have symptoms, it's when the symptoms no longer have you. And I had I, it was a good thing for me to hear again tonight that it's no longer when I it's not that about not having symptoms, it's when the symptoms don't have me. And that's my goal all the way through this. And it's been my goal in doing the YouTube channel, writing the book, getting up each day, is working on the symptoms not having me. Now, when the symptoms get really loud and that knock on the door, you know, is suddenly feels like an intruder barging in, it's a lot harder to do what we need to do, right? To stand up and face the day with all the crazy and painful thoughts, feelings, and sensations that can go along with this. Uh, but something else that I talk about in the interview with Drew, and again, I won't give it all away because I'd like you guys to listen to it, but I talk about the fact that, you know, there's no state of enlightenment. Like, you know, the Dalai Lama doesn't live in a state of enlightenment, just like there's no state of mindfulness. Mindfulness and enlightenment to me is no different than working through the process of um, not not having anxiety because anxiety is a part of being human. Okay. It's like I said before in, in, in my, in one of my segments, you know, it's, it's why we don't drink bleach. It's why we don't run down the middle of the street in traffic. It's why we, I don't know, do all the things that we do because there's signals about, about danger that are appropriate. But when we are in a disordered state of anxiety or we are in a, a highly sensitized state like we are, where the fight or flight and freeze is just, you know, um, you know, on fire. Um, we, you know, we can get caught, we can, we, excuse me, sorry, <coughs> dog walked in. We can kind of lose sight of, of what we need to do. And the idea that not every thought or feeling and sensation that we have in this has to have meaning, okay? And again, on a day when somebody's knocking at my door lightly versus pounding on the door, barging through the window, um, I seem to have a little bit more space to make meaning of it in a different way. The meaning is the narrative we create about it. You know, there's people that are out there in the world that live in chronic pain. Some of those people are miserable and, and consider themselves suffering. And some of those people consider themselves not suffering, but having chronic pain. It's the narrative with which they have created about their situation. So, um, I just had a benzo moment. If, if any of y'all picked up on that, my dog walked in and I had a total benzo moment. So any of you guys under, you know, going through this can totally relate to what I'm talking about. But anyway, one last thing I'll say before I kind of wrap this up is that I also mentioned the Stockdale paradox in this. And I mentioned this many, many times in other videos and audios, but it's the idea, you know, again, James Stockdale, prisoner of war in Vietnam, survives. Nobody understands how this man survives. And not only does he survive, but he survives psychologically relatively intact. How do you do that? Well, the Stockdale paradox, which is, I know I'm going to be okay. Today might not be that day. In fact, I'm sure it's not. Um, but I still have to do things today to get through this day. Um, and I still have to do what I have to do. And I needed to read that or hear that again today. Um, because the process that we're in can be very long. It can be very arduous. It can be very up and down. It can create a lot of, excuse my language, but like mental and physical fuckery, you know, that just leaves us questioning if, if we actually are okay. Um, and, you know, are we broken? Are we, are we injured? You know, I, we're definitely not broken. Um, and I, I've even in my own way, kind of moved away a little bit from injured. Um, I think that what we, what has happened to, to me, and I think for most of us, is that this chemical assault has created a state of such disequilibrium in my nervous system. And as we know, the nervous system is our entire power grid of our being. So it is not a small thing to be out of whack. Um, and as it's in this dysregulated state, it is, it creates, you know, the myriad of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of physical, mental, cognitive, emotional symptoms. Um, and so we have to be in this process, right, of, of healing, 
process of um, allowing time to pass while we recognize that this nervous system is in a state of disequilibrium and what can we do to potentially not make it worse. And that's another thing I needed to hear today. I may not be able to do a lot today to make it better. What can I do to not make it worse? So I'll just share one of the things that I did today that made it worse. I'll just be transparent with you guys. I woke up. I did not feel good. I had, you know, all of my mornings, to be honest, are kind of shitty. <laughs> but this morning there was just a lot of, and I'll say terror because it's, it's a grip it is, it is not, I feel a little afraid. It is, it is a grip that is physical and mental in nature. And I know intellectually what I need to do. I know I need to get my feet on the floor. I know I need to get out of that bed. I know I need to not lay there and ruminate and think, oh my God, how am I going to do this? Oh my God. And that's what I did. I laid there and I ruminated and I laid there and I did exactly the opposite of what I said in the last video. I didn't do, of course. I did, oh no, oh no, oh shit, oh gosh, oh whatever, you know. And as the day went on, I got progressively worse. And to the point that I was looking for something to help me. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. <laughs> can you turn to yourself? Is there something you can you can go back to you and learn from? And again, I keep a little journal in this and I was looking at that and then that was kind of overwhelming me and you know what I would say is um, you know going back and listening to myself on Drew Drew's podcast was like I said just a good reminder and really helpful and so I won't bore you with too many other details but I will go ahead and put the link down below if you haven't seen it um, please take a look at it um, if you are somebody that's on this channel and you are in the process of reading the, the, the waiting room, um, in terms of listening to the waiting room, because you can't read it, I'm so sorry. I think I'm only up to chapter 19. It was not my intention to leave you guys hanging. Um, so I am going to prioritize that. I had a lot going on and then I had a little bit of a setback myself. So um, I will get the rest of the book up in the next couple weeks. Um, but I did want to go ahead and make this link. And if you're somebody that's struggling with benzo withdrawal or you know somebody that's struggling with an SSRI or SNRI or antipsychotic or mood stabilizer, um, um, you know, obviously the benzos, right? Um, have, them take, have them take a listen to this. I have learned so much from Drew Lynn Salata, from Josh Fletcher, from Jenna Overbaugh, from Michelle... Kavanaugh with the D.A.R.E. program, from Maida at the D.A.R.E. program, from the D.A.R.E. book. Um, there's some really good resources out there, guys, and they're not writing about necessarily med discontinuation syndromes, but the principles in many ways still apply because they are dealing with nervous systems and we have to learn how to navigate our lives right now for whatever period of time, a month, six months, five years. I mean, I'm tapering you know, this June, well, the, actually, what is today? June 7th? Um, I'm at exactly three years right now of tapering. I have at least two more years to go. Um, now I am, you know, please don't look at me as, you know, as, as the gold standard here. I'm, I'm not. I just am going very slow because I just know what happened when I went faster. But for me, um, this is what I can do. So we have to find, you know, little things along the way that remind us in this process that it is a process um, and that, you know, we, as much as we want to be rid of this and get through this, there are things we're learning about ourselves that we never really wanted to learn this way, for sure. I know that half the stuff I've learned while it's been major in my life, it's this is not the way I wanted to learn it. Um, and this is not the way I wanted to feel. And I can get very stuck when I'm not focused on what I say in my in my talk with Drew. I can get very focused on poor me and why me and why now and why this and all of those things. So I'm going to go ahead and share the link below. Take care. Bye. Bye, guys.